Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chapter 33 of The House of the Scorpion. I'm getting all of this finished today. There's only three chapters left of the book, so I'm just going to blast right through them. And now going to Chapter 33, The Boneyard. A faint light shone under the door when the two young keepers arrived to fetch Matt and Chacho. Matt was so stiff, he fell over when they pulled him to his feet. <clears throat> came from behind the tape covering Chacho's mouth. They were urged outside to one of the carts the keepers used to move equipment around the factory. Jorge was in the driver's seat, smoking a cigarette. More tape was wrapped around the boy's ankles. The cart, will, the cart rolled slowly at first because it was solar-powered, but as the sun rose higher and flooded the salt flats, it picked up speed. Matt saw the shrimp tanks move past. He realized they were heading towards the western fence. The cart's wheels crunched along the gritty path and sand hissed across the ground to an early morning breeze. Matt was thirsty. He was hungry, too. He saw, with a kind of bitter pleasure, where his shoulder was encased in a plaster cast. Matt hoped he was in a lot of pain. After a while, the cart turned and bumped along the rougher ground. Matt saw they were driving parallel to the fence. He saw a white swirl of seagulls as they rose and sank along the Gulf of California. Their cries floated to him on the dusty wind. On and on the cart struggled. When it floundered in sand, the men had to jump out and put creosote branches under the wheels to urge it on. At last it jerked to a stop, and Matt was carried off by two young keepers. They came over a rise. Before them stretched the wide base and that had once been filled with living water and was now filled with dead whales. The bone stuck up like a gigantic bowl of thorns. This is what we call the bone yard, Jorge said pleasantly. Matt remembered someone saying when he first arrived. You won't get away with your snag swanky ways here. We've got something called the Boneyard, and any trumble maker who goes through it comes out as harmless as a lamb. Shall I take the tape off now? One of the keepers inquired. Only from his mouth, said Jorge. But that means he won't be able to climb out. He tried to kill me, Jorge shouted. Do you want a murderer crawling back in to stir up revolution? Carlos won't like it. You leave Carlos to me, said Jorge. Matt felt the tape rip off. He flexed his mouth, ran his tongue over his bruised lips. You think you're thirsty now, Jorge said. Wait until tomorrow. He's the murderer, cried Matt. But he had no time to say anything else. The men swung him up and out. He came down with a crash, and the bone shifted and let him fall through. Down he tumbled, rolling his way in, way in that until he arrived at a plateau of skulls. He hung in the midst of the sea of bones, with the blue sky visible through a fretwork of ribs and vertebrae. He turned his head cautiously. Below was a pit whose dark depths could only be guessed at. A few minutes later, he heard Chacho land not far away. The mass shifted again, and Matt, sli and Matt slipped down a few more feet. He felt a rib poke into his back. A fine dust of salt and sand pattered, its, uh, pattered over his face. He heard Chacho cough. He heard the men's feet crunch away and then the purr of the cart growing fainter and fainter until it was gone. Are you okay? called Chacho. Depends what you mean by okay. Matt was amazed he could still laugh, although he did it weakly. Are you hurt? Not much. Got any good escape plans? I'm working on it, said Matt. The salt powdered his face and got into his mouth. I wouldn't mind a drink. Don't talk about it, said Chacho. I think I could cut this tape if I find a sharp bone. There's one sticky into my back, Matt said. He spoke cheerfully as though he were working on a way to snatch up an extra ten minutes of sleep, not trying to escape a long, painful death. Some people have all the luck. Chacho spoke lightly, too, but Matt suspected he was just frightened. Matt wiggled, his, wiggled until his wrists touched the jagged bone. He saw back and forth, but he couldn't make any progress. The bone shifted and slid deeper into the darkness. Matt, cried Chacho with an edge of panic. I'm here. Well, that didn't work. Why don't you give it a try? In, in fact, Matt's heart was pounding, and he was afraid to move. The whole basin quivered, and he didn't know what would happen if he fell all the way to the bottom. Heck, oh heck, shouted Chacho. Matt heard him slither through the fretwork of bones. We've got all day. You don't have to hurry, said Matt. Shut up. I think there's something else in this pit. 
Matt thought he heard a high-pitched noise. Was it possible something lived in the darkness below? And what kind of creature could possibly choose such a home? They're bats. Horrible, slimy bats, yelled Chacho. Bats aren't slimy, Matt said relieved. A real creature is much better than the monster he'd imagined. Stop making jokes. They'll suck our blood. No, they won't, said Matt. Tamlin and I watched them dozens of times. They'll wait for dark. I saw it in a movie. They'll wait for dark and they'll come up and suck our blood. Chacho's panic was thrill and infectious. Matt began to get scared, too. Tamlin said they're just mice with wings. They're afraid of us as we are. One's coming at me, screamed Chacho. Keep still, don't move, yelled Matt. A horrible idea had just occurred to him, and he had to warn Chacho before anything else happened. Chacho kept screaming, and he must have heard Matt's advice because he didn't struggle. After a moment, Matt... After a moment, they stopped... His... <laughs> I can't talk. After a moment, his cries were stopped and replaced by sobbing. Chacho called Matt. The boy didn't answer. He wept on, hiccuping and trying to catch his breath. Matt turned carefully, searching for another sharp bone. Below, in the ga ghostly near blackness, he f tiny bats fluttered and squeaked. They must have found the pit almost as comfortable as a cave. They flitted here and there, navigating between bones like fish in a sea. A sour smell disturbed by their wing, disturbed by their wings, filtered up. Chacho, Matt yelled. I'm here. The bats are settling down. I'm going to try and cut the tape again. We'll never get out, groaned Chacho. Sure we will, said Matt, but we have to be very, very careful. We mustn't fall down any farther. We're going to die, said Chacho. If we try to climb out, the bones will shift. There's tons of them here. We'll fall into the bottom and they'll come down on top of us. Matt said nothing. That was exactly what, exactly the thought he'd had. For a few moments, he was swept with despair, unable to think clearly. Was this the end to the chance at life he'd been given by Tamlin and Celia? He'd never know what happened to him. They'd think he had deserted them. Tamlin says rabbits give up when they're caught by coyotes, Matt said after he'd calmed through his trust in his voice. He says they consent to die because they're animals and can't understand hope. But humans are different. They fight against death no matter how bad things seem. And sometimes, even when everything's against them, they win. Yeah, about once in a million years, said Chacho. Twice in a million, said Matt. There's two of us. You're a one dumb dummy, said dumb bunny, said Chacho, but he stopped crying. As the sun slowly worked its way across the sky, Matt became more and more thirsty. He tried not to think about it, but he couldn't help it. His tongue was glued to his mouth. His throat was gritty with sand. I found a sharp bone, said Chacho. I think it's a tooth. Great, said Matt, who was working with his bonds against a rib. The tape had an amazing ability to stretch. He sawed and sawed, but the tape merely lengthened and didn't break. But after a while, it became his uh, became loose enough for Matt to slip his hands free. I did it, he called. Me too, said Chacho. I'm working on my feet. For the first time, Matt felt real hope. He drew his legs up and carefully picked at the bonds with a fragment of bone. It was horribly exhausting. He had to move extremely slowly to keep from sliding deeper, and he had to stop every other minute. He realized he was growing weak. Uh, Chacho seemed to rest for long periods, too. Who's Tam Lin? he asked during one of these breaks. My father, said Matt. This time he didn't stumble over his words. That's funny, calling your parents by name. It's what they wanted. There was a long pause. Chacho said, Are you really a zombie? No, said Matt. Do you think I could talk like this if I were? But you've seen them? Yes, said Matt. The wind had died down and the air felt heavy and still. The silence was eerie, but it felt like because it felt like the desert was waiting for something to happen. Even the bats stopped chittering. Tell me about zombies said Chacho. So Matt described the brown-clad men and women who had toiled endlessly over the fields and gardeners who clipped the lawns of uh, El Patron's estate with scissors. We called them midgets, he said. It sounds like you were there a long time, said Chacho. All my life, Matt said, deciding for once to be honest. Were your parents idiots? 
I guess you could call them slaves. A lot of work had to be done by people with normal intelligence. Chacho sighed. So my father could be okay. He was a musician. Did you have musicians there? Yes, said Matt, thinking of Mr. Ortega. But Mr. Ortega couldn't have been Chacho's father. He'd been around too long. The sun was low in the west now. It was darker than Matt expected for this time of day, even with the light cut down by the pit. The breeze picked, uh, the breeze picked up again. It moaned like a lost spirit in the bones that turned surprisingly cold. It sounds like La Llorona, said Chacho. That's just a story, said Matt. My mother used to tell me about her, and my mother don't didn't lie. Chacho, react, uh, Chacho reacted instantly to any real or imagined insult to his mother. Matt knew he'd, she'd died when Chacho was six. Okay, I'll believe in La Llorona if you believe that bats aren't dangerous. I wish you hadn't brought them up, said Chacho. The wind blew even harder, sending a swirl of dust over the basin. The topmost bones rattled, and all at once, Matt saw a blinding flash of light followed by a crack of thunder. It's a storm, he said in wonder. The chill wind pushed the smell of rain at him, making him thirsty even more unbearable. Desert storms were rare, except in August and September, but they weren't unheard of. They blew up suddenly, wreaked havoc, and then vanished almost as quickly as they'd come. This one promised to be spectacular. The sky turned white and peached colored in the sun's, uh, sunset light as a giant cloud loomed overhead. Lightning forked. Matt counted from flash to thunder to gauge how far it was away. A mile, a half mile, a quarter mile, then right on top of them. The bottom of the cloud opened, pouring out hailstones as big as cherries. Catch them, shouted Matt, but the roar of the storm was so loud Chacho probably couldn't hear. Matt caught them as he as they skittered down bones and crammed them into his mouth. They were followed by rain, buckets and buckets of rain. Matt opened his mouth and let it pour in. The flashes of light he saw clinging ba he saw bats clinging to bones. He heard water rushing over the side of the basin. Then it was gone. The thunder retreated across the desert. The lightning grew fainter, but water still poured into the pit. Matt bunched up his shirt and sucked out as much moisture as he could. The rain had received him, but he hadn't gotten nearly as much water as he wanted. The sky was al almost dark now. Aim yourself at the nearest edge while you can still see. Ma called Chacho. My legs are free. Are yours? The boys didn't. An the boy didn't answer. Are you okay? Matt had the awful thought that Chacho had slipped down the bottom of the edge during the violent sh storm. Chacho, answer me. The bats, the boy said in a hollow voice. He was still nearby. Matt felt a rush of relief. They won't hurt you, he said. They're all over me, Chacho said in that odd voice. Me too. Matt suddenly became aware of the little creatures creeping onto his body. They're trying to get away from the water, he stammered, hoping it was true. Their nesting place is flooded, and I guess they want to get warm. They're waiting for it to be dar dark, Chacho said, and then they'll drink our blood. Don't be a complete idiot, shouted Matt. They're frightened, and they don't. They're frightened, and they're cold. At the same time, he felt instinctive horror at the stealthy movements. A distant flash of lightning showed him tiny creatures huddled against his chest. It had a flat nose and leaf-like ears. Its mouth just closed, delicate, needle-sharp teeth but it also had a baby tucked under one leathery wing. It was a mother trying to rescue her young from the flood. You wouldn't bite me, would you? He whispered to the mother bat. He turned slowly, freezing in place when the bones threatened to shift, then moving again, aiming towards where he thought the nearest edge lay. The, black clung, the bat clung briefly to his shirt before sliding off into the darkness. It was like being a swimmer in a strange and terrible sea. Every time Matt moved forward, he sank down a little. At one point, the bones weighed upon his back, and he feared they'd trapped him. But they shifted slightly and allowed him to move on. Yet every stroke short increased their weight. Soon he would be unable to move, and they would have to wait, like a bug imprisoned in amber, for death to find him. The pit was completely black when his hand struck against rock instead of bone. Matt Gath grasped the wall and inched himself upward until he was able to plant his feet against the stone. 
Now the bones seemed even heavier, but that was because he wasn't trying to force his way up through them. He leaned against the rock, panting with exhaustion. He found a trickle of storm water still flowing and lapped, a, lapped it like a dog. It was cold and mineral. It tasted wonderful. Chacho, he called. If you come towards my voice, you'll, near the, you'll reach the edge. There's water. But the boy didn't answer. I'll keep talking so you'll know where to go, said Matt. He talked about his childhood, leaving out things that would be hard to explain. He described Celia's apartments as trip to the, trips to the mountains with Tamlin. He described the Egypt pens and opium fields that surrounded them. Matt didn't know whether Chacho could hear him. The boy might have fainted, or the bats really might have drunk his blood. It was the middle of the night when Matt pulled over the edge and collapsed onto wet earth. He was unable to move. All the willpower he'd used to work up his way filled, filled deserted him. All the willpower he used to work his way free deserted him. He lay on his side when he fi with his half face half in the mud. He couldn't have moved if Jorge had shown up with an army of keepers. He had drifted in and out of consciousness. He heard a strange sound coming from the pit. Matt listened, trying to decide what animal made such a noise, and then it came to him. Chacho was snoring. The boy had fallen asleep from sheer exhaustion. He might still be trapped in the pit, but he was alive. And the bats hadn't drunk his blood after all. End of chapter 33. We're coming up on the last two chapters of this book, guys. Let's get through it. And I will see you all for chapter 34 next video.